Our next speaker, uh, she kind of needs no introduction because uh, I mean, her name is Kriti Karan. Uh, her father, as you know, is a renowned uh, tiger specialist, uh, but she's also grew up watching tigers at a very young age. But she's also a, a senior uh, conservationist and, uh, and a scientist with WCS, Wildlife Conservation Society New York. She's also adjunct faculty at NCBS and Duke University. She also has Na Nat Geo Explorer. She's also selected as a leader with World Economic Forum. Actually, her list is quite huge. So is her list of publications. So it's, it's a bit of uh, long, this thing. But uh, Kriti is somebody who's been working um, in areas uh, outside protected areas. And in the previous panel discussion, we discussed a lot about not much about what's inside the forest, but what really happens outside the forest. And Kriti's work has, over the years, has been focused on that. So to talk more about it, Kriti, over to you. I know it's been a long, inspiring, passionate, emotional day. And those of you who don't operate in our world have probably figured out that every government officer, every scientist, every conservationist cares very deeply for those animals, those places that we're all trying to save. We may have huge disagreements, but there's also deep fundamental respect that that is what's going to, I hope, carry us through forward. Um, I've spent the last 20 years as a conservation scientist. We all came to this cause because of emotion and childhood spent in different ways. But I think emotion needs to be backed by evidence. And I'm hoping to share some of that evidence that shows why India is special, why India is unique, and why every person in this room can do something to save wildlife. So I'm going to take you actually back in time, 200 years. And this is where I think the real megafauna collapse began in our country, right? Um, starting in the 1850s, British officers and Indian royalty started to go on these massive hunts. Um, this was all across India. And when I started to do my PhD, I wanted to capture what had happened to India's wildlife over the last 200 years. They went on these massive expeditions. There's one tiger at the bottom of that. It wasn't restricted to men. We had some women hunting as well. There were individuals who, t who shot over 300 tigers, several thousand rhinos, several thousand leopards, and all of this has been beautifully illustrated and captured um, in, 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 in many ways. But the person, I think, who wins the prize is uh, Maharaja Sadul Singh of Bikaner. If you go to the Bikaner Palace, even today, his hunting diary is preserved in a glass box that really is not protected. But he documents his individual shooting of almost 100,000 birds and animals across India. So people went on elephants. Uh, some of the most amazing Kedda operations actually took place in Karnataka. People went by boat. This is the Sundarbans. And people went by car. This was the 1920s. And this is where the acceleration of not just uh, how people moved, but what happens to animals took place. It was a lot easier to get out there and shoot animals from a car compared to horseback or elephant back. And um, one historian in India estimates that over this you know, 50 to 75 year period, we lost about 80,000 tigers. To put that in perspective, we're fighting to save those three to 4,000 that we have left on the planet today. We lost about 150,000 leopards. To put that in perspective, different leopard biologists are placing leopard numbers in India at about 10,000. And then we lost the magnificent cat, the cheetah. This animal ranged all the way from Africa into the Middle East, all the way down to Mysore. And by 1960, the last cheetah was shot. So what did I do? I mean, uh, as a biologist, I didn't expect to delve deep into history. There's not much we can thank the British for. Don't shoot me, Will. But one thing they did was keep extraordinary natural history records of what animals they'd seen, what animals they'd shot, and what I was able to reconstruct from visiting you know, uh, about 50 museums across the world, looking at every 
article written in the Indian Forester Journal of Bo uh, Bombay Natural History Society was 30,000 locations where all the, you know, the largest 25 mammals had been seen and shot. This took uh, about four years to do, but that constructs where animals were found in the past. What about the present? Uh, ended up working with a lot of amazing wildlife experts, photographers, naturalists uh, today trying to figure out if these animals were still around in the very same places. All of the, the fancy statistical modeling got us to what had happened. All of these maps, the dark blue areas, are places where these animals still persist. Um, and the lighter areas are, are places where they used to be but have been wiped out. Um, so for tigers, the estimate was a 67% range contraction over a 100-year 100, 100 period. For leopards, it was 36%, a more adaptable cat. All of us who watch these animals know this. For dole, it's a 62% range collapse. For elephants, a 43% range collapse. For gaur, 60% range collapse. Even something people take for granted, cheetah, you see cheetah everywhere, and you say, oh, this is a common species. They've also gone from a lot of places that they used to be historically. And finally, the only animal that doesn't seem to be to threaten the wild pig. And this is not an India that I want to see going forward. But what's been extraordinary is this is what took us to the 1950s. In the 1970s, we did have a prime minister who set up the, uh, the, the uh, Indian Forest Service, set up the laws, and over the last 45 years, You've, you've had several officers, the government, NGOs, individuals, partnering together to try and save India's wildlife in, in different ways, in different contexts. But I think we've actually brought several of these species back from the brink, and it is a conservation success. When I went uh, as a child to Nagrahole in you know, the early 80s, it wasn't that easy to see a tiger. When I go back to Kabini today, I'm thrilled beyond expectation because it's in that 30 odd years, it's gotten easier to see a tiger today. But there's been a price to, play, uh, to pay and that's been of conflict. And this is something I've wanted to work on for a very long time because India's protected areas only cover 5%. We, all of you who are photographers, and wildlife conservationists know that there's a lot of wildlife found outside, and what are we going to do to save these species found outside as well? So images like this are common. The previous panel kind of beautifully discussed the complexities of human-wildlife conflict. Um, images like this show the real hardship that families um, endure when they're losing a lot of crops, and in retaliation, you, see, you do see injuries like this, electrocutions like this. You see animals being injured, you see livestock being killed, and in retaliation, mobs are created, leopards are beaten up, leopards are dragged, tigers, sorry, tigers are snared, tigers are poisoned. This is the reality of human wildlife conflict in India today. The, what I, what, I wanted to do is, as a scientist, you start to go to little pockets and say, can I pick up larger trends? And this journey started in Madhya Pradesh in Khana in 2011. Over the last seven years, we've traveled to almost 3,000 villages across India. And we've been able to do this because of volunteers who came and helped us collect data in all of these locations. There is no way a team of you know, 10, 20 scientists can get out there and collect this kind of information. What were we trying to do? We were trying to understand what are the species involved? What are the pa patterns of conflict? Is there mitigation? Does mitigation work? Is there compensation in place? What we found very briefly, I don't, I was warned not to give a scientific talk, but there are, that there are clear hotspots of conflict around several of these protected areas. We documented uh, over 18 different species being responsible, and wherever you travel, it's a slightly different issue so it's not, it's not you, you can't kind of capture it in one, um, in, in, with one species or one location. What, what I found extraordinary was the Indian government actually has a compensation process and mechanism in place. 
when you compare this to Africa, when you compare this to Southeast Asia, where there is no compensation, we're already way ahead of what um, is in place. And so what is this? We, I, we went to you know, 17 sites. That still doesn't capture what's happening in India. We patiently filed RTIs in every state across India. This paper was just published two days ago. Uh, what it shows you is that um, Karnataka and Maharashtra have the highest conflict incidents across India. Karnataka and Maharashtra spend the most. And when you look at these numbers, um, it's about a, an average of about 100, uh, 1 lakh incidents of conflict per year in this country that the government is paying compensation for. You may argue that it's not enough, but I don't think there is any other country in this world where this kind of conflict is being reported or being compensated. And uh, significant amounts of uh, government funding going into compensation. And I also take this as a positive sign. We may be the number one state for conflict, but it also means that there's still a lot of wildlife persisting in our state. And that's something we need, we need to kind of uh, figure out what are we going to do. So when you look at the All India picture, 73% of the incidents are crop damage, 21% is livestock predation, 5.6% is human injury, and 0.4% is human death. Extraordinary for a country of a billion people. Yes, human lives matter, but we're fortunate that we're not losing tens of thousands of people to animals. We're losing a few thousand, and what are we going to do to solve this? Uh, to give you the global perspective, India spends about you know, $5.5 million a year compensating people. You look at Sweden on the top, they're spending $90 million a year because every wolf incident they will go pay 10,000 euros for. Um, and the question is how much compensation is enough and can we do more? So all the research, all the science, all the publications don't make a difference if you're not able to change reality. And this is something that came from working across India over the last 10 years. So about three years ago, we launched Project Wild Seve. We launched it outside Nagarhole and Bandipur, who had uh, compensated people 44,000 incidents in the last decade. And I felt that if you could make this work in a high conflict area, you could kind of scale this to any other park anywhere in this world. So Seve, as many of you know, been a means in service of. And the idea was simple. Um, everywhere you go, people have a cell phone. And if people could call in and report conflict, could we go and assist them in filing the claims? Our job is not to dispense the funds. We cannot do that. But what we can do is redress the issue when it happens. So we picked uh, Nagarhole and Bandipur. And what it is, it started out as a paper system. It's a simple open data kit. Um, we have 10 field assistants who are located in this entire landscape. They call a 1-800 toll-free number. Uh, within um, 24 hours, we've been able to get to 98% of people who've called us. Over the last three years, we've helped more than 10,300 families file claims with the government. We've been able to identify sort of the primary suspects, and I think there are simple solutions with livestock predations. There are no simple solutions with crop damage. But we, we are able to now pick up live monitoring of what's unfolding on the edges of these parks that we care very much about. And again, this shows, mirrors the All India picture because most of the problem is actually crop damage. Uh, what we've done is file these 10,300 claims, uh, and we've built goodwill over time. Initially, they were very suspect of the staff, like, uh, you know, are you going to come? Are you going to help us file these claims? But having done that, there are individuals who have called us 55 times in the three years. We've gone all 55 times. There are people who, you know, wanted to beat us up. And we've kind of, over time, you know, built that, that empathy that they know that we're trying to do our best. And I think this will go a long way in sort of building tolerance for wildlife. What also, what, another initiative that we've kind of taken is to build a simple solution, just build a better shed for your livestock. And what the data has done is it's given us cases where there's a lot of repeat attacks by tigers and leopards. And we've gone in and built these livestock protection sheds. And again, a solution 
that's far simpler than crop damage, but it is a must if you don't want people poisoning carcasses of livestock that have been killed. And so I think we're on the right start. This is not, I don't claim that this is the solution, it's a solution. It starts to show people that you don't just care about your animals, you also care for the people who live right next to the parks. And then I realized that wasn't enough. We were, you're, by dispensing compensation, you're kind of dealing with the economic losses. There's a lot of psychological trauma. There's a lot of human emotion, particularly when there's human injury and death involved. And I, I realized that we weren't really tackling the children who live in these high conflict villages. So just a few months ago, with National Geographic support, we launched a project called Wild Shale that particularly looks at children who live in high conflict villages and can you start to uh, build empathy and tolerance for wildlife. So it is a conservation program. It doesn't go to urban cities. It works in the rural villages right next to these parks. Um, we have adapted and um, built local curriculum. We're not using North American or Western European models of education. And we're trying to kind of inculcate pride in India's wildlife. It's done by an incredibly happy, exhausted, trained team of educators. Um, we build empathy for wildlife in many, many different ways. We've just started to do this, so I think there's much more collaboration possible. Uh, we showed them a video of elephants swimming. An entire class of 70 children stood up and started clapping. They didn't realize elephants knew how to swim. And you start you know, building these conversations of how are you similar to your tiger? How are you different from an elephant? And that's where the conversation begins to change. Um, this is an elephant game they play where they go forage like elephants. And um, elephants need 250 kilograms of food a day to survive. Any kid that didn't collect 250 kilograms worth of food, you know, died. So there is, there is a way to kind of get um, uh, I think education across in a way that's both fun and, and um, I think uh, that builds empathy for wildlife. So the ultimate goal of this project is to build knowledge and awareness, but not in a boring science textbook, biology, blah, blah, blah way, but really get people to understand why food webs matter. This is a simple rope game where animals start to fall out of a food web and when children play this game, they realize that even the smallest insect matters. Even that particular, you know, a, a particular bird matters. And this is not centered around large charismatic species. Um, I never thought that in India today, I would meet children who've never held a paintbrush. These are children who've used art, built dioramas, and learned to kind of recreate the landscapes that they see. And I think there's a role, I mean, Nirupa's mind-blowing work shows that there are a million different ways you can kind of build people's connect to nature. And ultimately, we also try and have a session on what it is to live with animals and live with conflict. And they, while they may not have directly seen conflict, they are very well aware of the challenges of living next to these parks. And of course, being a scientist, we have to evaluate. To say something is a success or a failure or what worked or what didn't work, we're working with every child to track their empathy. This is not one session. We spend over 15, hour, 15 hours over the course of a month with every child in all of these schools. And I think it's important to know if what we're doing doesn't work, because then we stop and we try something else and don't keep saying, this is what we're going to do uh, going ahead. So over the next five months, this program will reach thousands of children and in about, I think, 50 schools. But this is something that I want to kind of experiment with. We've done it in Kannada and in English, but we need to do it in Hindi. We need to do it in Marathi. We need to do it in, a, you know, in, in India's 800 different languages, if possible. So these are two examples. I don't think you know, there's one solution. I think while Shale was a, is an attempt to build empathy. I don't know if you're going to succeed or fail. While Seve is an attempt to build tolerance. And in that, I hope we will start to build uh, larger communities of people who care for wildlife. And I think to end, we, we kind of are in this extraordinary position of being a melting pot for wildlife. 
We celebrate India's language diversity, we celebrate our religious diversity, we celebrate all the other kinds of diversity, but we're incredibly diverse for wildlife as well. We share species with so many different continents, but what makes us unique is our incredibly high tolerance for wildlife, and I think as long as you can harness that in productive, in constructive ways, we are not going to see any more range collapses of these extraordinary animals, but we're actually going to be able to save them. Thank you.